it's wonderful to be at a conference that actually says transforming transportation. That was the name of the white paper I wrote when I started thinking about this, um, this whole um, idea. The idea came up um, as part of two questions that I got asked uh, within a span of about two months. So as Tom said, I was asked in, in uh, middle 2005, do I want to be the next CEO at SAP? And I said yes. And I got asked a question, how do you make the world a better place by 2020 by the head of the World Economic Forum? And, uh, and my thought on that was, well, if you could get one country off oil by 2020 in a way that is replicable so that other countries can copy the same model, that would be a, a way to make the world a better place by 2020. I think Microsoft likes the fact that I picked the second question and not the first question. Um, at least some people at Microsoft. Um, and so I, I thank them for giving us this opportunity to speak on their uh, wonderful conf uh, conference uh, hall. Last time I was here, was, uh, there was an earthquake, so I hope nothing happens this time. Um, so how do you run a country without oil? How do you run um, a whole country without oil so that it's not mandated by the top of the, the country, so we, we, we have to take places where you could make the decision by you know, sort of an edict by one person, um, so that it's driven by consumers up, so that it's all done with technologies we have today on the shelf. There's no time for a science project. We've got to get done within 10 years, uh, so that it's economically sensible. It's not a gift from the government. It's done by the powers of the economic powers of capitalism, um, so that the consumers actually like that kind of, conversion. It's convenient for them to, uh, to convert over uh, to some other source for transportation. And if you look at oil, oil is used, 50% of oil is used for transportation. Here's the, uh, the, the news flash as we say, if we didn't use it for transportation, we wouldn't dig it out of the ground to make plastic bottles. We definitely won't pay a hundred and odd dollars per barrel. We would replace it first. And so if it was not for cars, <clears throat> we wouldn't see oil getting so expensive so quickly. And the main reason it gets so expensive so quickly is because we gave oil a monopoly on cars. We, ha we have a monopoly on the energy that can come into a car it has to be a liquid form of carbohydrate. It has to be a CH bond that comes in liquid form. Now if it wasn't liquid, we have a lot of it in the US. We have a lot of fossil fuel in the US. And the problem is it has to come in a liquid form. The reason is we don't have any other infrastructure to put it into the car. All we have is gas stations and pipes. Now, it wouldn't matter if we could generate a ton more electricity right now. We have no infrastructure to put that electricity into the car. And we don't have cars that know how to receive it as a result of the fact we have no infrastructure. So we believe fundamentally the issue is an infrastructure problem. By the way, the US is always done great on massive infrastructure projects. So keep that at, at the foundation of what, uh, what we're talking about. So we looked at that problem, the fundamental problem of all these elements. We said, let's look at what we know how to do today. Batteries today, the front, the, the front runners on, on batteries today can make safe lithium ion batteries. Batteries that won't explode. If you put them into an oven, they won't blow up. They would be safer than what we put in the cars today. Um, and those batteries, um, have a price point, they have an energy density, they have, uh, they have characteristics, how many cycles could you have over their lives, and we took that as the, f this, the foundation for all of our starting points. We're not waiting for a new magic battery to be discovered in the, in the uh, halls of Stanford or, uh, or be scaled by the Department of Energy. That battery today with convenient cars, with five-seater cars that can drive as fast as we drive today on our freeways, would take you roughly about 100 to 120 miles. That's what we know how to do today. So how do you make a car which has a 120 mile electric tank convenient for the consumer? And the thought process is to put an infrastructure in the ground that would actually allow you to charge your car every time you would be able to stop. So every time you stop for normal course of the day, you go, you go home, you plug, you go to work, you plug. You go to downtown, you plug. You go to lunch, you go to a movie, you plug. What would that mean? It means a massive extension cord across the country. 
It means effectively a smart charge spot in every one of those locations. The smartness, by the way, is not very expensive smartness. All it means is it's identifiable spot. And what we do is we put those, those spots in the ground. That gives me the ability to tell you that I can do some interesting magic. Every time you're going to go into your car, it will be topped off to that kind of 120 mile range, 100 to 120 mile range. So that's the first part of the infrastructure. That takes care of normal course of the day. Because if somebody drives more than 100 miles every day to work, they would either change their place of work or they would change the place where they live. So the normal drive, your normal day-to-day -day drive will be covered. But we still need to cover for the exception. The exception is when I go to another location where there was no plug, I couldn't plug and I need to come back home and the battery range is no good for me. Or I decided to go on the road trip. I decided to go down the five all the way out to three, four, five hundred miles. And I do that every once in a while. Now if we asked you, as we did in the past with electric cars, to stop every hour for who knows, an hour or two hours to, to wait for the battery to charge. If we found the magic charging spot and the magic battery that would charge in 20 minutes, it would still not be convenient. If you had to stop for 20 minutes every hour and a half, every hour, hour and a half, that's called a Greyhound bus. <laughs> and so that's not a car. It's not convenient. And so the second element of what we did in our infrastructure design is to have the battery in the car become an exchangeable battery. I come into a station, I drive into something that looks like a car wash, my depleted battery comes out, a full battery comes in, and I keep driving. That full cycle today, the, the out-in, takes about a minute. Coming into the station, plugging in, coming out of the station will take you about two, three minutes. So you end up going in and out of the station in less time than it took you to fill up gasoline. So now your normal behavior is covered, your exceptional behavior is covered, and what we do as an operator is to guarantee you that you won't do that exchange more times than you filled up on gasoline during the year. We will guarantee it. So if you come in 52 times a year, you're within the range of the once a week that you did before on gasoline. You come 53 times, we'll pay you money. 54th time, we'll pay you more money. 55th time, we'll pay you even more money. Why? Because we think that every time you swap a battery, it's an inconvenience, it's not a service. What we also do is we separate between the ownership on the car and the battery. You never buy a battery. It's not your asset. It is the operator's asset. So we bring you back the same way you used cars with gasoline today. You buy your car. It's your car. You own it. You can ding it. You can color it. You can pimp your ride. You can do whatever you want. You could finance it and you can sell it, just like you did before. But you don't pay for the battery. What do you pay? You pay for miles. In the same way as cell phone operators ask you to pay for minutes when you use your phone. How much do you pay per mile? The same as you pay for gasoline. So you're buying a car that's a 25 miles per gallon car, you pay Whatever the gallon is, divided by 25. That's your cost per mile. If you drive too fast, too slow, you pay a bit more. If you drive normally, you pay less. You buy a big car, you pay more per mile. You buy a small car, you pay, le you pay less per mile. We charge you, effectively, the same when you use electricity and batteries in the network. We don't charge you for the electricity at home, we don't charge you for the electricity on the grid, we don't charge you for the battery, for the exchange, for the setup of the network. We charge you a per mile basis. 